you're anything like me, then you love cars and you love burning money by fueling big gas guzzling engines. But whether we like it or not, times are changing and electric cars are well and truly here. Now I have zero experience with electric cars, but recently I've started to open up to the idea of potentially owning one. And this one is pretty high up on my list. This is the Cupra Bourne and the Bourne is Cupra's first fully electric car. It's based heavily on the Volkswagen ID3 platform, but they've made a few changes to try and make it a little bit different. The main difference is obviously the way it looks. You might agree that most electric cars nowadays look a bit samey, kind of like alien spaceships with weird and big bulbous designs, but the Cupra Bourne really doesn't look like every other electric car. I really like the way this thing looks. I think the proportions work really well. It looks like a proper little sporty hot hatch. The Cupra Bourne comes in three different trim levels, the V1, the V2, and the V3. There is also two different battery sizes available, a 58 and a 77 kilowatt hour battery. This particular car has the biggest and most powerful battery, and it's a V3 car, so it's fully spec'd out and costs around 45,000 pounds. The only thing that lets you know that this is a V3 car from the outside are these 20 inch Firestorm wheels. There's a lot of these kind of aero style wheels out there nowadays that just look a bit cheap and plasticky, but I think these work really well on this car. One thing that really surprised me about this car is the size of it. From the outside, it looks pretty small, but it's actually quite a big car and it definitely gives off more like mini SUV vibes rather than hot hatch. We've got plenty of space in here and like the exterior design of the car, the interior is also really unique and there's a bunch of nice materials. It's covered in this like black and grey kind of suede material which I like a lot. You can also get all the grey bits in like a dark blue colour but in my opinion the grey is the one. There are a few bits of this like cheaper scratchy plastics but this is a really nice place to be and it feels and looks so much better than most other interiors. It's got character which a lot of new cars nowadays just don't have. I'm six foot four and I can sit comfortably in the back with decent legroom, decent headroom, but there is only two seats back there. We have a 385 litre boot and if you put the seats down, you'll get over 1200 litres of space. So you can fit quite a lot in this car if you need to. The best thing about electric cars is the performance. Now this isn't the quickest electric car out there, but it is definitely quick enough. It's easy to obsess over 0 to 60 times, but in reality, we just want something that can pull out of a junction quickly, do the odd overtake and get us up to the speed limit. And this does all of that really well. We've got 230 brake horsepower going to the rear wheels and the 0 to 60 is around seven seconds. But the thing that gets you with this car is the speed it gets from zero to 30 miles an hour, zero to 40 miles an hour. The power is instant, it's smooth, but most of all, it's fun. And that's what I love most about this car. You don't need to be absolutely rinsing it to enjoy it. And don't get me wrong, this car is fun to drive at higher speeds, but where this car really shines is at lower speeds. This Cupra Vaughan has the dynamic package, which is an 830 pound option, and that lets you decide how stiff you want the suspension to be. Stiffening up the suspension does make a noticeable difference in terms of how it feels, but I pretty much just leave it in comfort mode all the time. I'm sure if you were driving more aggressively on smoother roads, then the stiffer suspension settings would have more use, but for our bumpy UK roads, comfort mode is the one. I think the suspension is the thing that surprised me the most about this car. The ride is so smooth. I'm talking like getting close to Audi S8 levels of smooth. It can be so relaxing if you want it to be. It just glides over bumps and on the motorway, oh, you can just sit back, relax and cruise. Like I said earlier, this feels more like a mini SUV than a hot hatch. The sitting position's pretty high up and you sit higher than most other cars on the road. I'm guessing it's because we're sat on top of the battery, but it's not a bad thing as it keeps the center of gravity as low as possible. We've got good visibility. The seats are comfy. They look good. This is just a really nice and relaxing car to drive. We have a massive 12 inch touchscreen here for our infotainment. The graphics on the screen is really nice and it's pretty easy to navigate, but, and I'm gonna vent here, this isn't aimed at Cupra specifically, but when are we gonna get proper responsive touchscreens in our cars? The technology of cars in general has come so far, but it's like these screens are just stuck 15 years in the past on most cars. This is not just a Cupra thing. 
Polestar has good screens, Tesla has good screens. Everyone else needs to catch up. Come on, let's do it, let's do it. Underneath the screen, we have these weird little buttons for your volume and your heating controls. These are rubbish, like these are really rubbish. At nighttime, you can't see them at all. There's no lighting on there whatsoever. The only other issue I have in this car, literally the only other issue, is these steering wheel buttons. They're really easy to just accidentally press with the palm of your hand while you're driving, but if you are trying to press the buttons, the feedback is terrible. They're really like, they feel sticky and bleh. They're just not good buttons at all. Please fix. These two things are the only things holding this car back because everything else is, is so good. But people have actually spotted a, a facelifted Cupra Born. So fingers crossed, we see that soon and they fix that and they fix this. In front of me, we have a little 5.3 inch driver's display, which shows all the important stuff like your speed, your battery life, a bunch of other bits. Above that, we have a heads up display, which is the best heads up display I've ever seen. It is massive. We've got heated and massaging seats. All the driver assist features like cruise control, park assist, lane assist, which is annoying as ever. Wireless charging for your phone. We've got wireless Apple CarPlay. We've got Android Auto. We've got a Beats audio sound system. That's a 470 pound option, but to have a good sound system in an electric car is just essential. It's so quiet in here. So to have good audio is just, mwah. Should we do a little launch? We might as well, let's do it. Right, we're all clear. Put it in the sportiest mode. Now I don't really need to do anything apart from slam the throttle. So, three, two, one. <laughs> Ten, twenty, thirty, forty, and there's sixty. Woo! It is quick. The acceleration definitely eases off after around forty mile an hour, but up until that point, it is very fast. And then we come to the most controversial topic when it comes to electric cars, and that is the range. This is the most powerful born with the biggest 77 kilowatt hour battery, and it has a WLTP range of 465 miles. I don't know what those WLTP dudes were smoking when they came up with that figure, but in reality, you can expect to get a solid 300 miles out of this car. I've had this car for around a week. I've tested it in various different situations, and these are my results. If I absolutely granny this car, I can comfortably get 275 to 300 miles, and that's with mostly city driving with a bit of motorway. If I take this car out for a quicker drive on some of my favorite roads, I'm still pretty much guaranteed to get more than 200 miles of range. This car also gets like a one pedal driving kind of mode. So if we switch this little gear selector over to B, so when you come off the accelerator, the car will automatically just brake for you and regenerate some power for the battery. I was quite surprised by this as I've been on a few journeys where there's quite a lot of downhill sections and I've gained mileage. I've traveled miles and I've gained miles. Now, don't quote me on this, but after living with this car for a little bit, I am confident that if you drove at, say, mainly lower city speeds, avoided motorways, you could even go for the 18-inch wheels instead of these massive 20-inch ones, you could consistently get 300 miles of range out of this car. Yeah, we need more chargers, and we definitely need more rapid chargers, but for what most people would probably be using this car for, 300 miles is pretty respectable. And on the topic of chargers, let's talk about the costs of charging an electric car. Things are gonna get a bit nerdy here, so bear with me. I'm gonna give you the numbers for this specific car. So a 77 kilowatt hour battery, and for a full zero to 100% charge, which realistically, you're probably never gonna need, but it just helps make it a little bit more easy to understand. So a standard three pin plug will charge this car up to three kilowatt hours, which gives the car about eight miles of range for every hour it's on charge. This is pretty bad and should only really be used in emergencies, but if you're using proper chargers, it is much quicker. In my area, I only really have access to 22 and 50 kilowatt hour chargers. A 22 kilowatt hour charger takes around three hours and 54 minutes, and a 50 kilowatt hour charger would take around an hour and 43 minutes. However, 
faster chargers are pretty common now and with a rapid charger this car can charge at up to 135 kilowatt hours so if you have access to one of those you can go from zero to 100 percent charge in just 39 minutes and the cost of that charge is basically determined by whatever that specific energy provider is charging per kilowatt hour the average cost near me is around 69p per kilowatt hour so a full zero to 100% charge is going to cost about £53. Some providers charge more, some charge less, and there is free ones out there if you're willing to look for them. There are apps that will show you charges near you, how much they cost, whether they're available, whether they're broken. Zapmap is the one that I've been using. The ideal setup for charging your car would be to have a proper 7 kilowatt hour home charger installed, and that would mean you could charge your car fully in around 12 hours and it would be much cheaper as some energy providers have off-peak prices as low as 10p per kilowatt hour. So at 10p per kilowatt hour, you could plug your car in in the evening, go to bed, wake up, you'd have a full battery, and it would have cost you less than eight pounds. It should also be said that it's not recommended to charge a battery to 100% all the time, and to keep your battery in good health, you should only really charge it to 80%. Yeah. It's complicated, but hopefully that gives you some idea of how it all works. So, how would I summarize the Coupe Reborn? Well, I bloody love it. Yes, there's a few issues with the interior that need to be fixed, but aside from that, this is such a great car. I love the way it looks, but the thing that gets me about this car is it's just so easy. You get in, you stick it in drive, and boom, you're off. It's comfortable, it's relaxing to drive, and you can have fun in it without breaking any laws. You know what? I would love to see a sportier version of this car, so more power, an extra motor in the front, so four-wheel drive, a more aggressive setup. We know that Volkswagen are working on the ID3 GTX, which is just a souped-up version of a standard ID3, and that car has all of the things I just mentioned, so it could happen. If they did that and they fixed the little niggles with the screen and these horrible steering wheel buttons, I think I'd have one. <laughs>